do you know about American history? If you know anything about it, you know that some of the stories are not always easygoing, happily ever after. Sometimes we need to look into the heart and soul of some great Americans and American history. Today you are going to have an amazing opportunity to meet an amazing American. My name is Vin DeQuino, and today we have as a guest Reuben Silverbird. Reuben, let's talk writing. It is an honor to even be at this table with you. Uh, your book is a wonderful book, My Life in Two Worlds. Tell me about the world of Reuben. My Life in Two Worlds took a long time to write. Uh, and the title itself has been my life in two worlds. Uh, and in this case, it means the white world and the red world. Mm. My own people's world. Yep. And living with all peoples of the world, which are different colors. Uh, in our Apache way of thinking, Nedney Apache, uh, we have four colors, white, black, red, and yellow. Mm. And they represent the four directions, the four seasons, but they also represent the four colors of the world. Oh. And uh, I find that this title fits me, in a way, my life in two worlds, because I live in a mixed-up world of uh, white, yeah. where I have to adapt according to the ways, and sometimes not very much accepted because of a certain intelligence that I have within this brain up here, and considered to, uh, I don't dance, <laughs> although I can dance, <laughs> yeah. I'd rather talk. Yeah. And then I'm not accepted in my red world by my people because I'm too white. Uh, <laughs> so you oh see, boy. you live on the fence. That's right. No, that's right. I understand that. And so, so that's the title. Book, yeah. So writing this book isn't a hobby. It's a passion. Of course. Yeah. So you have a message. You want people to understand where your people came from. Where did they come from? What? What is the heart and soul of what you really believe? Um, it's Again, it's taken a long time and yeah. a lot of research mm -hmm. for me to talk this way. Because I believe that you should research your subject before you talk or Absolutely. write about it. Absolutely. And it's taken years. I had to go to Europe. Wow. You S spent a great deal of time in Europe, right? Yes, I spent uh, 14 years in Europe traveling, i uh, become a personality in Europe, representing my people in a way. Right. Uh, the, what are my people are. Um, but I also wanted to research the white world. That was important for me. To know exactly w what they believe and how they believe it? That's right. And, and what are the different, uh, there are so many personalities in a way. But you know, I find too that the world, people of the world, are all alike. <laughs> in a yeah. sense. Yeah, in a sense, you're right. You know, uh, and we are a very big subject in Europe, for instance, mm -hmm. my people. Even more so sometimes than in America itself. Wow, wow, that's interesting. Th th you'd say that because here is where we should know because it's our history well you know what I say in Europe what I like about Europe is that I have friends uh, in Austria for instance who have a castle and it was mm -hmm. built in the 1400s Wow that was before America yeah. was born even before us <laughs> okay <laughs> so uh, this is amazing, you see. I can see these things in Europe. I go to Rome once a year. Wow. Just to walk 
where Julius Caesar walked. Wow. Where all these people, you see. I've been to Israel. Wow. Uh, I mean, beautifully history. But America, this country, yeah. has no antiques like that. Yeah, that's the true. only antiques that America has are neglected. <laughs> us. <laughs> yes, We're the that's antiques. Right. That's right. That's and, right. And it's amazing because uh, Europeans are very interested. Yeah, in our beginning. In here. our background. Well, what's very interesting is your book was not published in America first. It was published in Europe first. Isn't that right? That's correct. Wow. And and it I believe in German, right? In German. Wow. And it has not been published in America as yet. Wow. Well, it's time. <laughs> you know. We'll work on that. <laughs> and and the thing is, I chose on this book to just open a door about my life history. Tell me about your childhood, growing up. Well, you know, I'm one of those people that I, again, um, America is used to getting rid of the, the, the things that they have that are unique to the world. Yeah. You know, uh, one thing is Route 66, all right? And I was born almost on Route 66. Wow. On the way to California. Wow. Of seven children, I was the only one born in California. Wow. My father was on the way to Hollywood to become a character actor. Because wow. I come from an acting family. Oh. Which in itself is very unique. Because Indians at that time were still struggling to accommodate themselves or get used to the reservations. Now, my mother was very pregnant and of course before we got to Hollywood, which they intended to get <laughs> before they had dinner, <laughs> but my mother said, Joseph, it's time. So I was born en route in California. Wow. Uh, and I was born a miracle child. That's what we call it in our people's oh, world. Yeah. I was born blind without sight. Oh my goodness. One of my favorite books that recalls it. The uh, and, and I know you, you do a wonderful version of this is uh, Knots on a Counting Rope. And the young boy talks to his grandfather and his grandfather says you were born in a veil of darkness. Uh, boy, uh, uh, boy of blue horses. Yes. yes. Oh. This story is so close to my heart. Oh, I Be love it because it involved a blind child. Wow. Tell me the story again, yeah. Grandfather. Please, Grandfather, tell, tell me, me the, the story. story. Okay, one more time, I'll tell you the story. <laughs> uh, you were riding fast. Was I going really fast? <laughs> you see, this story associates with me what I am and what I've been. Yeah. Conquering your fears, your dark mountains, he calls it. Right. Yeah. I lived in the world of darkness for four and a half years of my life. Wow. Oh, that's amazing. It is amazing, but I learn more y yep. in that time. Sometimes you learn more in darkness than you do in light. Absolutely. And people are afraid of the darkness. Yeah. I'm not afraid of the darkness. That's a good thing. Because I've lived there. Uh, this is the beginning of my book, almost. Wow. That I was almost born on Route 66. <laughs> I was born in a tennis court. Oh, in <laughs> a tennis court. That's pretty amazing. And my mother brought me to this world Wow! while my father went looking for a doctor at 3.30 in the morning. At what point in your life did you say, I am a man on a mission. I am here to deliver a message that needs to be heard. I felt this need to do this since I was very young. I have spent most of my life, I tell people that where people say to me, I slept eight hours last night, I envy them. Because even as a child, I've never slept more than six hours. Wow. I would wake up early with my mother and take walks. Um, I have had a unique life because of my parents. In my lectures, I talk about family because I had a very sacred family. 
So your life was more of a journey, and a journey to learn and deliver a message? My message has always been about the roots of a tree. Mm. They, the roots of a tree are very important, and that's father and mother. Uh, grandfather and grandmother. Family traditions. Sometimes I think America has lost hold of some of those wonderful family traditions. We've lost them. Yeah. They, they, they didn't, they've been, they're more and more being lost. And it's a shame because the children of today need them. They need, need them. this wonderful heritage that we used to, that became this country. Yeah. That and our roots. <laughs> you know, these are roots that are missing today. Uh, the one word that I always talk about is respect. You know, it's good to say, I love you. Yeah. It's an easy word, three yeah. words, I love you. Yeah. But respect comes before love. When I was a child, my father had many close friends. And sometimes they would say to me, and my father would introduce me and they'd say, my name is Joe. And my father would look, look at me and say, Mr. Joe. I wasn't allowed to call them by their first name because they were elders and they had to have the respect of elders. So I could say Mr. Joe or Miss, but I couldn't just say, hey, Joe. Uh, they earned respect, they should get respect. Uh, it's, it's important. And when you learn to respect others, you learn to respect yourself and and the earth, I know that's something you believe in. <laughs> Respect Mother Earth. Uh, this, we live on this, this is part of us. And, you know, we have to respect nature and the trees and, and today there is not the respect. It's so huge, you're absolutely right. Well, you know, we have 566 different nations in America of oh. Indians, what they call Indians. Right which is a wrong title, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Native Americans is a wrong title as well. <laughs> because uh, anybody that comes to this country and a child is born here, that child is a Native American. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. What I like to call ourselves is we're the original peoples of this land. Original people, okay. We are the original people yes, of this land. Yes, you are. You know? You are. Anyway, uh, we have different cultures in these 566 different nations. But we have one thing in common, love for Mother Earth. That's it. This is the strength. Yep. This is the power that keeps us alive. And we've lost that. Yeah. You know, when you talk about, you know, you, we went through a terrible time here with mortgages and people land and they took the houses away. Yep. It's nothing. We come without this to this Earth we leave without it. Yep. And so we put too much stock. In the material. Absolutely. Yep. Um, but this book, I also chose to talk about the fact that I spent a lot of time in New York City. And I spent a lot of time with a lot of very important people. I mean, if I mention the name Jerry Weintraub. Wow. This is a powerful man. Yes, very powerful, powerful man. Name. He was my manager. Wow. Uh, if I mention Bobby Chardoff. Wow. Bobby Chardoff, another one who was my manager. Uh, Charlie Rapp, the king of the Catskill Mountains. Yeah. These are people that I knew. They were my mentors in a way. They supported me for a long time and gave me the life that made me a human being in New York City because I came from the woods. I came from Albuquerque, wow. from Santa Fe, uh, into this midst of the big city. It was a new adventure. So all this is in this, new, this first book, these stories mm. uh, of also my parents, the gift that it is that we get from our parents, the fact that we should love our father and mother, 
regardless of what they are yeah. or what we might have thought they were. They gave you life. Yeah, and that's it, oh, the respect for life. That's the key. Yes. And if you can't respect life, you're not going to have respect for yourself. Absolutely. And eventually you're taking away something important from living. Absolutely. This is something that drastically, for some reason or another today, is missing. And children, they miss that touch of grandmother and grandfather today. Yep. I suggest in my schools, because I, I visit Montessori schools, Steiner schools, right. and I speak to the children, and I say that they should bring once a week an elderly couple to speak to the children. Yeah. Because they're missing this. Yeah, I. One of the things I say over and over again, and I've been quoted many times. Of course, knowing me, the the words change a little bit. But basically, if we do not teach the children of today to respect their yesterday, we're going to steal from them some of their tomorrow. Absolutely. <laughs> and and that's really what it's about. So it's our responsibility, just like knots on a counting rope. We need to pass the story to the youth, to let them understand what we've seen, where we've been. Be until they see our footsteps, they can't make footsteps of their own. And they will not have a tomorrow. That's true. That is a possibility, you know. That's true. We're going to th we're going that route. Yep. You know, uh, it's a dangerous position that we're in today. Yeah. Um, maybe it has to do a lot with the technology that we have, the internet, the iPhones, oh, the, all yeah. this. Um, we spend too much time not concentrating on life. Yep. I, I've had a unique experience because I raised two children and my daughter has two children. And those two children spend a great deal of time with us again. So I have the wonderful opportunity of being a close grandparent and watching life again. It's almost a second look. And watching these two children grow again and seeing what they're seeing and hearing what they're hearing frightens me. It frightens <laughs> me. It's a scary world out there. And some of the things that they see is so contradictory and traditional values are lost and some of the, they don't understand it and yet when you explain it to them and when they see what tradition can be they embrace it and we have to teach them how to embrace mother earth and each other how to love brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers but families when I was teaching, half of my students were from families that have been broken. That's right. You know, and they're and they have to learn how to understand that life does move on, but they do have to understand traditional values. You know, I have one part of my book that says "I do." The word "I do," yep, and it's about partnership marriage yeah the words I do do you take this one with <laughs> I do well, you two know, big words it's two words <laughs> that are so sacred yeah and, and are not lived up to yeah today I today it almost seems is it's I do if I don't change my mind right and or if uh, we yeah. don't sign the right agreement <laughs> for this and for that you know this is not important again when you go into a matrimonial engagement like this, it's so sacred. Yeah. I believe that there should be an instruction prior to this before two people get together. And I think I mentioned that in the book, that yeah. it's the duty of a preacher, a priest, or whatever rabbi might be to say to the couple, well, I'm sorry, but you have to have instruction from me for a year before you make this decision. <laughs> there you go. Next to the word respect is the word responsibility. Oh. And 
It's frightening. Sometimes I believe that many of the young Americans don't understand the importance of responsibility. That, that you have to do what you have to do. And there are some things that are expected of you. That is the problem. But I find that this is a little lopsided in a way. Okay. I also, also get, I will have to <laughs> tell you, that I get 80% women in my seminars and 20% wow. men. Wow. And this is nothing that the man has to be blamed for this. Right. But the women seem to be more responsible, mm. more in tune than men. This is an important factor. Yeah. Uh, I happen to be a very lucky young boy because I had a father that was responsible and a mother that was responsible. Yeah. The two people knew. I, all I had to do is look at them and I knew the love they had between them. Yeah. So you see, the best example that two people can pay a child is the way they act and react yep. with each other. I think some of the difficulty is that in this world that we're living in, responsibility has come to mean putting bread on the table. I think what we really need to know it's not putting the bread on the table. It's learning how to share the bread that's important. That's right. That's right. Um, and one word that's very important for men is obligation. Yes. Obligation. Responsibility, responsibility yes, but obligation. Yeah. There's an obligation that you enter into. <laughs> that's right. You see? And the obligation isn't always to buy them something. It's yes, to teach them the value of the world you live in. And the children we don't realize that, are the one, that the ones that are going to suffer in the mm -hmm. long run are the children. Because I yep. meet many, I'm, I meet many children that are 50 years old complaining about their parents. <laughs> yeah. I yep. mean, this is, in Canada, I just got an email before I left uh, Vienna, and the email was from a woman, and it said, I have a daughter that I have problems with. Could you help me? And I, and she called me. Not wow. an email, she called me first. Wow. Because my number's on my website. Uh. And I said, how old is your daughter? She's 57 years old. Yeah. I said, ma'am, <laughs> what you have to do is write me an email <laughs> yeah. about this whole subject. Because on the phone, it's kind of going to cost you a lot of money. <laughs> so she wrote me an email. And the thing is, uh, it's it's not the the thing is the children. A parent loves their child, and the child is still their child if they were are seventy years old. Absolutely. Okay. As my mother still calls me. My mother is alive today. Calls me and makes sure I'm doing the right thing. Absolutely. <laughs> That's parents, and children don't understand this. Yeah. You know they think well. I've got to be turned loose already. Yeah. It is something that I was not built in from this age, childhood. Yeah. The love and respect for parenthood. Right. And, and both ways. Parents have to respect the children as people, and the children have to respect their parents as people. And that's all that's crucial. And it's not always what you give them. Well, in, in now in my older years, one of the things I'm, I'm understanding more than ever before, it's not having what you want. It's wanting what you have that's important. Sometimes we want so much, and we forget everything we have, like Mother Earth. And we forget that we share this world. It isn't ours. Uh, what, there's that incredible song about Native Americans that it says, sometimes we think we own the land we land on. That it's ours because we were here. And it's unity. It's sharing. It's understanding that it all belongs to us. Is that true? Uh, you know, we have a saying, we belong to the land. The land does not belong to there us. There you go. There you go. 
That's it. You know, and little things. You know, we say it in, in English and in many songs, little things mean a lot. Right. The smallest thing should make you happy. That's right. That's right. You know, I sometimes accomplished nothing, but I had a good meeting. Yeah. And I walked down the street singing. Yeah. And people look, you know. Yeah. I'm happy. Yeah. My and meeting went well. It seems that, you know, what do you want in this world? You ask a child today, and the answer always seems to be more. <laughs> more. How yeah. about enjoying what you have and make the best of what you have? You know, uh, life, life is, is so short. Yep. That if we don't stop to think about these things, you know, the children are so important, but they're not being brought up in a way, in a sense that it is important that every moment that you live is important. Don't think about tomorrow. Tomorrow's not here yet. Yep. Don't think about yesterday. That's gone. Think about the moment and live for the moment. Yep. We are not being taught this in the school system. Let's talk about the school system. Oh boy. It is, it's down, it's backwards. It's not giving us the teaching that we need to create a loving heart. Yep. It's all in here. Yep. We're taught things that we will never use in life, but we're not taught the principles of life. I tell the children in school, how many hours do you spend here? Oh, we come in the morning and we live it for, well, you know, this, these teachers are like parents to you. <laughs> you know how hard they worked for me to come and speak to you? They called me months ago and they prepared this. So they should be earned, they should earn that respect from you. Because they are parents, they, they want to do for you. Uh, the, you see, teachers today, it's become to a job. Yeah. In yeah. too much of a and, way. And it is. And, but sometimes we have to see the beauty of life through it all. Yes. Now, this has been a wonderful opportunity for me to hear you. But I know that there's something going on with you. You have another book in the back of your head. And you intend to say some pretty poignant things in this new book. Just give me a couple, a minute or so, about this new book you're planning. Well, I'll give you the title. Okay. Reservations. Oh, wow. They still exist in this country. Yeah, they do. Okay. And the subtitle of it is Psychological Genocide of the Mind. Psychological Genocide of the Mind. Oh, my goodness. Yes. You know, we've never really, we still have the reservations. The soldiers are not there guarding them anymore, but they're still there. And that has created a dilemma for our people in this country. I've always suggested, like in my, new bo in my book that's there now, is that Italy has San Marino Republic. Hmm. Uh, uh, France has Monaco. Why can't we have a republic here within America? That is something that I think we're going to have to leave our audience with. And why can't we? Today, you have had the opportunity to meet someone who has respect for the land he lives in. He's not a Native American. He's an original American. Ruben, I can't thank you enough for coming with us today. My you pleasure. are coming back. I want to know more about this book. I want to learn about this new book. I want you to deliver your message to our people. Thank you for joining us. It has been absolutely our pleasure to have you with us, and it really has been our pleasure to have you with us. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you. Us.
When I think of the world, I think of the beauty it brings In our blindness, we can't really see That Mother Earth works so hard for us to be <laughs> 